summer sales for legal marijuana. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. Four months after Ohio voters legalized recreational marijuana, Ohio appears ready to open sales to every adult. The permitting and rulemaking process is moving along. The state must release applications for dispensaries in early June, and it has until September to grant them to those who meet the requirements. Supporters of legal marijuana for fun praise state officials for their efficiency, and they say legal sales could begin before September. Meanwhile, any changes to the law to be made by the state legislature have gone nowhere. Dale Rowland, this is this process is moving much more smoothly than the process for medical marijuana, which seemed to take forever. Why is that, do you think? Well, I don't know if a part of it is second time around, and I suppose some may dispute that. Um, we're kind of going to school in the medical marijuana process um, from several years ago. In fact, step one is to have the medical marijuana current, currently licensed facilities be the first ones to use the recreational marijuana. So they're known to the state. They've already gone through various procedures for applications and all that. Uh, the challenge may come then when you get to all the newbies out there. And anything the legislature does have to do, you know, that's a challenge because everything comes down to you know, we have, we're going to have a fight over the speaker. So if one candidate says yay, the other one says nay, pretty much no matter what. Julie, what kind, there is a rulemaking process, and there could be rules on advertising. What other rules might be out there? Well, the one goes, we're before? watching for um, in May is the dual licensing, and this is what has allowed things to uh, kind of be streamlined because they're saying, okay, existing dispensaries, we have over 100 mm -hmm. around who are selling medical, now would be able to do both. They would still have to get the new license, but obviously they've got the bricks and mortar, they've got the um, custom customer base, and, and uh, the businesses are already started up. And so that's the one we're looking for most immediately. Um, now the governor also wants to see that um, the uh, uh, smoking is not allowed in public. I believe that that would have to be uh, legislative as opposed to a rulemaking. But you know, those are those are some other things around it. Uh, but they could also do nothing, as Daryl says. The you know the legislature is somewhat divided over how to proceed on on any legislation. Morgan, does the fact that this passed fairly easily in November does that help the process move along more quickly? This. It's not a, it wasn't a toss-up. It was 55-45. Yeah. yeah, not controversial. Uh, I think that it showed that this was something that a lot of Ohioans were looking to see and having broader access to marijuana and not just have it be tied to a medical need. You know, it is interesting on the, the dual licensing and, and how the application works. There is the risk here of just benefiting some of the first movers in the medical marijuana process that wasn't necessarily the most level of playing field. So, you know, I'll still be looking to the government to try to ensure, the state government try to ensure that we are getting you know, a wide set of stakeholders here who are able to take advantage of this, this how, new opportunity. How much of this is this industry, Mark? There's, there's a lot of money to be made here. Right now that money is being made in Michigan with their sales. Is it these, these industry folks are, are pushing this to get through? Seems that's always the argument we hear. They're making money elsewhere. Why not bring it here? Mm -hmm. um, that decision's already been made. I think with the legislature, when they do get around to doing something, and Daryl's analysis is correct about some of the log jams in the House, the two areas that you'll see them focus on is, number one, the public smoking. Most people who go to big cities don't like the fact that marijuana is in the air everywhere you walk. It's kind of gross. I have, you know, I've been to Chicago and Boston and Detroit, and I haven't smelled it. Yeah, I've been to L.A., there. Philadelphia, New York, and I mm -hmm. have, and so maybe we're just getting different We're hanging in different neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> now, the other issue that I think they're going to legislate on is access to children. Certainly anybody who would allow children access to these things to the point where they could ingest some of the... Uh, the, the edibles, if you will, needs to face serious prison time for allowing that to happen. So look for legislation in those two areas. Now, the supporters of legal marijuana say that smoking in public is no different than drinking an open container of beer. If it's prohibited, it's prohibited. Is that still up for debate? I, I went through the law and I couldn't find a specific prohibition about smoking in public. It was, you couldn't drive a car with marijuana. You couldn't operate a, well, a motorboat. Well, I guess there are nuances. When we had our smoking 
a ban debate in the state. You know, the, the question was sort of, can you in a restaurant and can you maybe in a bar, but if it's enclosed, but it's ventilated and so forth, things like that. And so whether you can just walking down the street um, would seem kind of hard to regulate. Yeah. yeah and, and just to be clear and put things in context, I'm much more concerned about the risks from the gambling that now has been unleashed through our state of some of the recklessness and driving in terms of like the level of risk that we're facing as a state uh, compared to any of the risks, whether it's the public smoking or otherwise that are connected to, to marijuana. Daryl, are you surprised that four months later, I mean, I know there's this dispute between the speaker and the Senate president, but nothing has been done to, to tighten this up a, a little bit by the legislature. Not very surprised, to be honest with you. I mean, again, you look at everything from last year, no matter the topic, this legislature just moved at a snail's pace and got very few meaningful pieces of legislation across the finish line. Um, Governor DeWine has been pleading with them, you know, we need to keep the black market out. We need to get rules established. The voters have spoken. He is, you know, he was against it. But the voters have spoken. It says We need to get these things in place. Deaf ears so far. Um, there is another piece of the rulemaking, too, which has to do with preferential treatment for um, people who had um, previous convictions or their families and other sorts of um, uh, potential groups that could benefit from the licenses. And um, that's in a different department and a different set of rules that are still being waited for. So, you know, it's a little bit unclear if it'll go quite as fast as we think, mm -hmm. but... Um, it could. Would that hold up the initial opening of sales or would that be down the road for, for future licenses? I think it could hold it up because um, they would, those would get, if they're getting preferential treatment, they would have to go first, yeah. right? So as Morgan yeah. says, if they're, if they're running into yeah. the market with everybody who's already established, that wouldn't really meet that. Yeah, I think the key point about the legislature is it's not a substantive uh, decision by them to not take action. I think a lot of those legislators want to take action. This is term limits again, creating blockades for leadership, and that's why things, nothing is moving. It's not just that this isn't moving. It's not a substantive rejection by legislators wanting to legislate in this area. There's, it didn't get on the ballot because it would have violated the one issue rule, Morgan, but the expungement of crimes, convictions, that would no longer be crimes. That would have to be done differently, but with this legislature, that you can't be optimistic that's going to happen. No, and I, I think I would challenge, I mean, you know, we can debate the the utility of term limits or not. I've been on the record before that I would self-impose term limits on myself if elected, for example, but I don't think that should be a pass for what we are seeing in the Ohio State Legislature at this point. It is a completely complete abdication of duty to serve the public from a lot of the folks that we are finding there, especially, um, I would argue, on one side of the aisle, and it's a real shame because we have pressing problems in, in Ohio beyond just marijuana, but lots of different issues, and it doesn't seem to be a priority for them to do their jobs. Well, here's a problem. I'm not sure how pressing it is, but it's turns out Ohio is not the only state that may exclude Joe Biden from its ballot in November. Like as is the case in Ohio, Alabama's deadline for qualifying for the ballot becomes before the Democratic National Convention in August. To get on the ballot, Democrats would have to change how or when they nominate President Biden or Ohio would have to change state law to extend the deadline. The state legislature did just that in 2012 and 2020 when conventions happened after the deadline. This week, Senate President Matt Huffman told reporters it's not going to be a big deal. It would be solved one way or another. Julie Carr Smythe, is he right? Is this much ado about nothing? I think it it might be. I think Democrats have a number of options here. Um, one is, you know, maybe take that one little piece of their convention and take it virtual, for example, which they had to do during COVID anyway. Um, or um, there's also the option that they might litigate this. I mean, we all are familiar with the fact that this 14th Amendment uh, series of, of lawsuits came about um, trying to keep Donald Trump off ballots. And, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has now kind of spoken on that, which would make it seem to me more likely that they would have a winning argument that, you know, states can't mess with these federal candidates. It seems like Matt Huffman, his tone has changed a little bit. He said this is a Democrat's problem at first. Now he's saying, look, we're not going to keep Joe Biden off the ballot. But he just seems like he doesn't want to deal with this. Let's remember how we got here. I've advised a couple of presidential campaigns as their lawyers in Ohio. Ohio law is available for anybody to look up on the Internet and read. So whoever was advising the Democrats about when to have their convention 
it's their job to know how you get on the ballot in each state. And the notion that their mistake needs to be Ohio's problem is kind of ridiculous. Having said that, um, Donald Trump will win Ohio whether Joe Biden's on the ballot or not, so I don't think Republicans worry about Joe Biden being on the ballot. The problem, Morgan, is down ballot. Should Joe Biden not be on the ballot, would it really affect Sherrod Brown and his turnout, or is he a popular enough guy among his base and his supporters to get their votes out? Yeah, I mean, it does seem like those are going to be very different races, as noted. I agree with him. I mean, yeah, we're, we're not facing a competitive presidential race in Ohio by any means. But I do think the narrative here matters. And we saw when this issue first dropped that there was the attempt to try to equate some of what was happening with, you know, whether or not we would have President Biden, this kind of procedural issue on the Ohio ballot versus the case that went to the Supreme Court, which really was about former President Trump engaging in behavior that undermined the electoral process uh, when he wasn't able to be successful. Those are two very different things. If you're not paying close attention, there's a chance to conflate them. And I think that was part of the motivation but here, making still, this such a big deal. It still comes down to who should decide. Should it be the voters or should it be the secretaries of state's offices in, in these states, right? Decide about who's who, who should be on the ballot, yeah. who, the, who should run for president. Exactly, exactly. And we saw this week even J.D. Vance agreed with that as a point. Yeah, so. but the laws are the laws. That's the thing is... But we've let's, changed let's the, law the law pretty easily in the past. But, when but, Trump's convention but, was after the deadline. Should we, right? Yeah. I mean, can we change the law is a different question yeah. from should somebody who wants to get on the ballot have to go read the code and then follow the code? And in every other instance, the answer has been yes. But there is um, also precedent for accepting a provisional nomination that you then update from the convention, both in Ohio and in other states, as I understand it. Do Washington this year has done it. Yeah. Do could they just stick this in the capital budget that's going to be voted on soon? Like, they, like they're stuck in the state budget. I think it was 2012. They could. They, they could do it. Yeah, either way they want. How about a permanent change? You think they might do a permanent change? And for presidential candidates, it's 60 days and not 90 days before the election. Would that be Would that be a wise thing? I don't know. That's bordering on common sense, Mike. So <laughs> and we're getting close to the line here. <laughs> All right. This week, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that some death records are not subject to public disclosure. This case dates back to the start of the COVID pandemic when former dispatch reporter Randy Ludlow tried to get cause of death information and the names and addresses of people who died. The state refused and Ludlow sued. And the Supreme Court has now ruled the names and addresses combined with other medical information would violate the privacy of the deceased. Ludlow and other reporters wanted the information to know how many people dying from COVID were in nursing homes and in particular, which nursing homes. The state was unwilling to identify the exact nursing homes where the deaths occurred, so we did not know which nursing homes were doing a better job than others in controlling COVID. Mark Weaver, you're an expert in Ohio open records law. Should privacy, privacy follow you to the grave? I think if the state legislature wants it to, they can pass that. Uh, Justice Fisher wrote this opinion. I have read it carefully. His argument was not one based on policy. He said when you look at the statutes, they don't allow this to happen. You don't, that your protected health information, which is what they call this language, follows you to the grave. And the legislature has the ability to change that. And Justice Fisher's decision, joined by uh, four other justices, simply said, go to your le the legislature and ask them to change this. Don't ask us to change it by looking around the statute. Daryl, you were working with Randy at the time of this dispute. <coughs> um, what was the attitude among you and, and him and the other reporters in your staff? Oh, yeah. The, w w this was a process that took months. And, you know, I personally negotiated with the Ohio Department of Health to try to get these records. And uh, it was, I should have documented the process of excuses from can't do it, proprietary data, you name it. It was uh, can't do it. And then it just turned out to be the truth was won't do it. And I, I think we have sort of contradictory parts of the law. You're the lawyer. I don't even play one on TV. Um, but the thing that I think for the, your average um, Joe and Jane did we say Bob and Betty Buckeye? Is that the, is that the accepted norm on WSU That's as well? That's the Gene Krebs. All right. All right. Gene Krebs <laughs> description. All right. All right. Whoever, whomever. Yeah. Anyhow, um, when they hear that these records are public individually, you know, so the right of prophecy does not follow you, not just to the grave, but into the grave. It is not on a single record. Put them all together in a database, it does. Well, but Justice Fisher said, if you're asking for Joe's, Joe Smith's death certificate, you're giving his name to 
the office that holds the death certificates, and that is one statute. What the dispatch was asking for was, we don't know their names, give us how they died, who died, and then we can put it all together. His argument was, and the Supreme Court agreed, two different statutes, two different purposes. In the case you say, you have the name already, I'm going to go get my mother's death certificate, I know her name, I go to the county, I ask for the death certificate. Morgan, where, where do you see this? Where, privacy is important, um, but also the public's right to know perhaps which facilities were doing a better job on COVID than others it was, was very important in t spring of 2020. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I do a lot of work on tech policy, tech issues, privacy, wholeheartedly support uh, protecting our privacy. It's hard to understand the policy justification here in not extending what is available for an individual request to, so, to a larger public, especially when we're looking at not just if you want to do analysis on COVID, but a whole host of health issues and trends to see across the state what are areas that we need to do different targeting of health resources. You would think that that would be of interest to the government. But as we've already discussed, and this is where I think it's a bit of a quagmire for us in Ohio. I agree, Mark, if the, if the statute doesn't say it, then we should change the statute. But if we have a legislature that isn't interested in doing anything substantive, then where do the people go? Well, it's not just this legislature, Julie. When was the last time you, you can recall a, little, a legislative body <laughs> Making records more open. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have we have pretty good records laws in this state comparatively, but you're right. I mean, we haven't we haven't seen a real significant rewrite of our or op, uh, you know ad Opening. additions yeah. uh, in in quite some time in all my time here, which is 20 plus years. Well, the biggest change was when now state auditor Keith Faber, when he was in the legislature, started the process that the dispatch used, which is you don't need to hire yeah. a lawyer and sue. You can go to the Court of Claims, file a $25 application, and be in mediation in a few weeks. And that was a, a, a plus for openness and a plus for Keith Faber to have done that. Yeah, the OSU student newspaper, The Lantern, used that process to successfully get some records open. I want to ask you about Jennifer Bruner's argument, Mark, that the, in, the federal definition of an individual is someone who breathes and has a beating heart. And if, if you're dead, you're no longer an individual, and thus the rights don't apply. Yeah, when, when a Supreme Court justice cites to another body of law, like in this case federal law, you know it's because they don't have any body of law to cite from. But doesn't they're, federal they're law by. trump state law? No, not on this issue. Federal mm -hmm. law under the Supremacy Clause, when there's a conflict, will apply, or when the U.S. Constitution suggests it. But we have our own body of state law, and public records law is largely state law, not federal law. I was curious, Daryl, if there were conversations about redacting various pieces of this. I'm sure there were. Um, well, to get there, at the health issue without... There were. I mean, and in fact, we got the database without the names and addresses. But that's useful because that does not show you what we wanted to find out to look at the health records and be able to tell Ohioans, you know, these nursing homes, a lot of people are dying at. You know, these nursing homes, they're doing pretty well. We've become so much more conscious in providing that sort of openness, that sort of information to consumers about, you know, Governor DeWine just earlier this year. New ratings for nursing homes, more details. But this is one of the most, the, the most serious uh, pandemic, you know, in any of our lives. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not sharing that vital information did, with the public. Did you ask for the names to be redacted and just give us the addresses and the cause of death? Well, here's the problem. What address do they list? Mm -hmm. We need to, you know, you need to, to match them up. But even then, it, it, it's very challenging. I mean, you know, there's a small part of me who says, oh, thank goodness they turned that down because that would have been so much data analysis. That <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but it would have been worth it, yeah. yeah. All right, let's get to our last topic. Despite a court ruling and a legislature averse to most statewide bans, Governor DeWine's push to regulate social media and smartphones continues. The governor has called on state lawmakers to consider a bill that would require schools to regulate smartphone use. A number of Ohio schools have made the decision to eliminate smartphone use during the school day. And I believe clearly that is the right decision. <laughs> These phones are clearly detrimental to learning. They're detrimental to our children's mental health. And they truly do need to be removed from our classrooms in Ohio. The Ohio law that would require social media companies to get parents permission for users under the age of 16 is on hold because of a federal court ruling. 
The governor called on lawmakers to craft a new law that would win court approval. Morgan Harper, on the cell phone ban or smartphone, keep calling them cell phones, they're not cell phones anymore, <laughs> smartphones ban in schools, uh, should the state regulate that? This is a tricky issue, and you know, I, I do find myself in the somewhat unusual position of, to an extent, agreeing with Governor DeWine on the risks about, of social, social media and smartphone usage at very young ages. We know already that that's having a detrimental impact, especially as young people are hitting their teenage years. And, and I do think that we should be very thoughtful about how much access we're allowing them. I think part of the risk, though, in going too broadly here is that for a lot of, depending on the school district, for a lot of students, the classroom might be their only exposure and accessibility to technology and to learning how to use different technological resources and get up to speed on that. And so, uh, you know, just a, a wholesale ban is maybe not the best approach. The only other point I would make is, I think in this initial discussion of the policy, you're talking about, you know, TikTok in, in particular is one of the uh, most uh, problematic social media platforms. I think they're all quite problematic, mm -hmm. regardless of their parent company uh, of government affiliation, yeah. and, and we need to be thinking about got that. a moment of agreement between the Democrat and the Republican here. I think everything Morgan said is exactly correct. Particularly young girls, that we know the studies show their image are affected by what they see on social media. Now, the government shouldn't be controlling what they're doing when they get home, but they do have technology in the classroom. They have laptops, they have iPads, but the notion of having a phone all day long raises all sorts of problems, not just for learning, but for self-image, uh, self-confidence, and uh, I don't think the people who don't aren't aware of what kids are doing nowadays. There are there are youngsters, twenty you know people under twenty, who can't be away from their phone for for a few hours without panicking about this. <laughs> At the very least, being away, getting used to being away from it from yeah. eight to three might be a great way to show them life goes on without your phone in your hand. I think there are people under fifty who can't be away from their yeah. phone for that long. Is a statewide? They were very selective on which <laughs> statewide bans they like to impose. The legislature <laughs> is this one they're willing to to do. Well, it, it probably is. I mean, they're they're really um, targeting schools right at the moment, and um, I, I do just find it kind of curious why you know because it, any principal can keep uh, phones out of their their school or out of the classroom. Um, maybe you want to do a an experiment with your phone or maybe you need to use it for you know I don't know yeah. that every child in Ohio has a computer at their school uh, so it just it seems as as Morgan says it's a very fraught kind of situation how about home home this is another home rule issue why not leave it to the districts to do it or do the districts want the statewide ban <laughs> well, to, to cover the school board complaints yeah. that, from parents that well I think that would be a help because one of the arguments against this concept is schools can do it right now on their own. They don't need anything, the state legislature or the governor, to do anything. You know, you can do this exact same ban, and the way I understand it, right now. Yeah, there are, I think Dublin's doing it now in some schools. Yeah. And guess what? We go back to the speaker's race. When I talk about the speaker's race, um, Senate President Matt Huffman is term limited. He wants to be Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. Jason Stevens, the existing Speaker of the House, would love to have another term. So again, one says one thing. In this case, Huffman says, yeah, we should regulate. Jason Stevens says, well, no, schools can already do it. I'm worried about, you know, big brother in Columbus and all that. And again, here we sit. Now, he's not the entire caucus in the, in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And again, as you, as you saw right here, it's not a, a partisan divide sort of thing here. So the dynamics will be really interesting to see on this one. Mark, can they make a new law that would, the, on social media, parental permission? The judge said this was too blunt. Yeah. It was remarkably blunt, he said. And there's a move to create a new law that would be a little narrower. Can they do that? I understand the need for people wanting to have parental permission for social media, but for, for these companies to have to have different rules state by state, particularly when you're near state line, you might be pinging off cell towers in another state, it's very hard to enforce. So there are logistical problems, separate and apart from the policy issue, which I think it's a good idea to have parental permission. It's just hard to enforce. Morgan, do we give too much blame to, to social media for anxiety among kids? No. I think that these social media platforms are some of the most problematic companies facing us globally, and they should be heavily 
heavily regulated and we need to be considering structural solutions to make sure that they don't have so much power over our young people because they're doing a lot of damage and all, not only to our young people but also to our economy and preventing further innovation. Let's get to our off the record parting shots. Mark Weaver up first. This week in Chicago, the Free Press, which is a great new balanced uh, press outlet, sent a reporter to a meeting of people who were planning on coming to the Democrat convention in Chicago and shutting it down. They practiced shouting death to America, death to Israel, and how to get around the law to cause real mayhem. And I'm worried for the city of Chicago. It could be a repeat of 1968. Mm -hmm. Morgan. So in the coming week, we will probably, it seems like, seeing a final rule on non-compete agreements coming out of the federal government uh, that prevent people from switching employers, starting businesses in their area of expertise. So it'll be interesting to see where the Federal Trade Commission lands on that and, and how that'll impact our employers and workers throughout Ohio. Julie. I'm watching the uh, legislative sessions that are coming on Wednesday and particularly looking at a bill that could uh, resolve a problem from House Bill 6 days on energy efficiency. Uh, it's been in the works for over a year and there's a possibility maybe it'll get a vote. All right. Daryl. Um, I've been covering the city of Circleville a lot, which is a fur piece from the state government politics. but. Uh, uh, Somebody called it, from Circleville, called it Circusville, and it's kind of lived up to that moniker, if you will. Uh, just a, tid, a tidbit of breaking news today. Um, Keith Faber was asked to come in and look at all these financial irregularities that have been alleged. He has decided that um, he's not going to do that because the allegations do not rise to the level of a crime. This was involving the police department down there. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm going to end with a Bible reading. Uh, my son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh, proving that fear of media and technology dates back to the Old Testament. So we've been here before. <laughs> that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Continue the conversation online. Watch us anytime at WOSU.org. For our crew and panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.